Chapter 18 Timba On summer days, while I was out of doors, weeding in the garden, picking fruit, gathering vegetables, or hanging out of washing, I can hear the sharp toot or toot toot or toot 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 from the logging cabin nearest us. These toots were the signals given by the, quote, whistle punk, end quote, to direct the operations of the skitter bringing in the logs. It was a cheerful sound and made a pleasant break in the great blanket of silence which hug over the mountains on summer days. Occasionally, though, the whistle would give a long, mournful wail, which lasted for several minutes and meant that a man had been hurt or killed. This sound crept up my back with icy fingers and made me vow I would never let Bob work in the woods, as did many of the other farmers. All the kettle boys worked in the woods, and they told me gruesome tales of crushed legs, smashed hands, high riggers falling from the tops of great trees, fallers being killed by falling limbs, and logging truck drivers tipping over their trucks and being crushed by their own loads. The kettles worked for the small outfits that logged with steam donkey engines and hauled their logs to the mills on trucks. Their longing camp, whose whistle I could hear, was a very large concern. They ran three sides, which meant they had three great skidders, to which ran three railroad spurs. So they could log three mountains at a time. Bob had several very good friends among the loggers. There were Tom and Mike Burphy, both since killed in accidents in the woods, who, quote, ran sides, end quote, for this logging company. They were actually superintendents. Both were unmarried, very quiet, terrific drinkers, and painfully shy. There was also Cecil Moorhead, six feet, seven inches tall, considered the best faller in the country. Also unmarried, very quiet, a terrific drinker, and painfully shy. Whenever any of these three got drunk enough, they might drive up to see us. Once Bob decided he would like an eggnog and came up to ask me if I would make it. Of course, I said I would, whereupon he went out to his car and returned with a water bucket of eggs, a gallon of cream, and a gallon of whiskey. I said, do you want me to make enough for the whole camp, Tom? Oh, no, Betty, he said. I have the kind of headache and thought an eggnog would taste good. I thought I might as well bring stuff for us all to have one. Mike was the same. Sometimes he would come up and bring steaks for me to cook. They were invariably two inches thick and each large enough for six hungry people. Mike always brought to a piece. The day after one such occasion, I took one of the steaks to Mrs. Hicks and two to Mrs. Kettle and had to stand helplessly by and watch each good lady place the beautiful tender steaks in a cold skillet over a slow fire with lots of chopped onions and carrots. I knew without being there that by dinner, every speck of juice would have been drawn out and the steaks would be gray and chewy like pieces of a thick, wet blanket. Once I suggested to Mrs. Kettle that steak put into a very hot pan and cooked over a hot fire was more tender and kept its juices. She said, not for me, lady. I've ate steaks cooked that way in restaurants. They was all bloody. We likes our meat cooked, though. Clean through. One time, Tom took Bob and me to a poker game at a company house. We watched for a while. When Tom took out a roll of bills about six inches in diameter, peeled off $50 and said mildly to the banker, she wants to sit in a hand. I drew to an inside straight, made it, and won $72. Everyone groaned when I showed them what I had done, and several left in disgust. Bob took my place and lost all but three of my $72.
Late that summer, when there was already beginning to be a tingly feeling of fall in the air, Tom invited us to visit the logging camp and to see his, quote, side, end quote, in action. I left Dan with Mrs. Hicks, and Bob and I drove through the mountains to the camp where they were logging. On the way, we passed bare and ugly hills, which had once been beautiful green mountains, and saw mile after mile of slashings, ugly, dry as tinder, and inexcusable. The small companies were careless and wasteful in their logging, but their attempts at destruction were feeble and unimportant compared to the wholesale devastation this company left in its wake. I was surprised at the size of the camp. It was like a small town. There were stores, bunkhouses, mess halls, equipment sheds, shower houses, and offices on one side of the road. On the other were 40 or 50 company houses for married men and their families. All of the buildings were brown with white trimmings, and many of the houses had white picket fences around their yards. Tom was waiting for us and introduced us to the general superintendent, the timekeeper, and several other officials. Then we climbed aboard the train and up to the mountains. The train was a long string of flat cars which hauled logs from the woods to Dock Tom Bay. We stood by the steps of the cab while the loggers rode on the cars. The skitter was a very large steam donkey rung by oil instead of wood as were the small donkeys and mounted on the track. The skitter had a spar, and there was a spar tree in the woods. By means of steel cables and drums, the logs were whisked into the air and loaded on the flat cars. There was a man in the cab of the skitter who, according to the signals from the whistle punk, quote, backed up easy, end quote, quote, held everything, end quote, and quote, highballed, end quote. There may have been other signals I have since forgotten. I watched the choker men and the hook tender fasten the chokers on a log as the hook tender yelled signals to the whistle punk. Woo! shouted the hook tender. The whistle punk stamped his clacker, which was connected to the skitter by an electric wire, and the whistle went toot. The man in the cab let out a little more cable and backed up or did whatever the whistle directed. When the chokers had been fastened and everything was ready, the choker man and the hook tenders scrambled back out of the way. The hook tender yelled, Woo! 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 The whistle punk clacked three times. The skitter answered, Toot! 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 And the great log was jerked into the air, where it swung and swayed for a few minutes. Then away it highballed toward the skitter, and the train. It was very exciting to watch, but I was scared to death when Tom insisted that I take the electric signal from the whistle punk and operate it myself. I was so nervous that I signaled, quote, highball, end quote, when the hook tender wanted a little slack and the chokers were not set. The men down by the log shouted and Tom grabbed the clacker and signaled, hold everything. I could hear the logger shouting. Well, of all the goddamn sniveling little... Then Tom called out, Watch the language, fellas. There's a lady here. I was very embarrassed and glad to leave before the loggers could scramble up to find out, quote, what in hell was going on, end quote. As we walked up the road to the train, I could hear the muted but vehement cursing of the men when they found out a woman had been monkeying with the whistle. Working in my garden the next day, I heard the familiar toot toot from the logging camp, and I thought complacently, a little too much time, jerk her back a foot or so. Later on, I heard the mournful wail of the whistle signaling an accident, and my distress was even more acute than before, because now I knew more of the men, had seen where they worked, had been shown some of the dangers. But I didn't know until two weeks later that the call had been for our dear friend Cecil, who had been hit on the head by a falling limb. He came to see us when he got out of the hospital, his head still stitched in bandages. Crack my head like an egg, he told us cheerfully. That limb hit me so hard on the head it drove my feet six inches into the ground, they tell me. All I remember is shouting, Timber! 
than waking up in the hospital with one hell of a headache. They patched his head with steel plates, and except for a more or less continuous headache, he was as good as new. But his logging days were over. It was Cecil's idea that we drive to an inlet to see a long chute. He said casually one evening, I think it would be fun to pack a picnic lunch and drive down tomorrow and watch them shoot the logs into the water. Would you like to go, Betty? Would I like to go? Ha! Huh. If he had suggested that we spend the day in the Crossroad Cemetery or take a picnic lunch to the town funeral parlor, I would have given an enthusiastic yes. True, our social life had picked up somewhat by the end of that second summer, but I had as yet no need for a date book, for even I could remember that the day was Tuesday and that three weeks from next Wednesday was Bob's Grange meeting and that my engagement was a Christmas party at the schoolhouse approximately four months from Friday night. I packed a lunch of fried chicken, stuffed eggs, tomatoes from the garden, and homemade bread. We stopped at a farm on the way and bought a gallon of ice-cold buttermilk for 10 cents and a market basket of sun-ripened peaches for 25 cents. It promised to be a good picnic no matter where we went. The inlet, a natural canal formed by the bed of an extinct glacier, was 70 miles long and about two miles wide. It extended from Docktown through dense forests, along banks of huge gray stones with gnarled fur springing from their crevices at artistic intervals, past flat, sandy flats with willow fringe streams and lovely little bridges. Beside oyster flats, summer camps, small towns, and logging works. The road followed the inlet so closely that we were almost driving on the beach and we reached our destination, a place where the sand was fine and white and had a small stream emptied into the inlet. We parked the car under a willow tree, stepped across the road, and were on our picnic ground directly opposite the long chute. The shore on the other side, about half a mile from us, was a steep bluff down the face of which extended the long chute. The first log came down while I was arranging the baby. I heard a tremendous dull boom like a faraway explosion and turned around just in time to see a geyser of water shoot into the air for a hundred feet or more, burst like a rocket, fling crystal steams of water in all directions, and subside so slowly it was like watching a slow motion picture. As the water cleared, the log bobbed up with a circle of ripples which spread and grew until they were washing the beach on our side with small slaps. It was such a tremendous spectacle that it seemed unbelievable we could sit comfortably on the beach eating our chicken and watch log after log come hurtling down. After lunch, we went swimming in the lukewarm salt water of the inlet, then drove home in the late afternoon sunlight. Coming back through the mountains, serene and cool in their dark green robes, I asked Cecil how long he thought our forest would last. He was very pessimistic. Look, he said, see those red flags? I knew they were planted every two or three miles. Those flags mean, watch out for trucks. And trucks mean a skid road. And every skid road means a logging outfit. The smaller the outfit, the worse the waste. Improper logging is like a bum shot trying to shoot a certain man in a large crowd. He might get his man in the first shot, but he's more likely to shoot two or three dozen innocent people trying to hit the man. I counted 27 red flags on the way home. Some of them may have been old. Some may have belonged to pole cutters, but even 10 were too many. Bob was so enthusiastic about logging, loggers, camp life, and logging terms that he asked Cecil if he would show him how to fell an enormous cedar on the back of our place. So one morning they set out, armed with Cecil's double-bitted falling axe with narrow, deadly, sharp blades and Cecil's falling saw, which was so sharp and delicately set that they handled it like a soap bubble. For a while, I heard the ring of axe blows, then pounding, then the even droning of the saw. Bob yelled for me 
to come out where they were. I didn't want to go at all. If both of us got clunked on the head by falling limbs, who would go for help? Who would care for the baby? Anyway, this job was extra dangerous because the tree had a bad lean. The shouting continued, however, so I girded up any loins and hiked out. I found them both standing on springboards, which had been inserted in opposite sides of the trunk, about five feet from the ground. These were necessary to avoid cutting through the swollen base of the tree. In the east side of the tree, a deep cut had been made with the axe. The saw was almost through. The tree was swaying and groaning horribly. I thought it was an excellent idea if they both got off those springboards and came back to the house and let the next storm take down the tree, but they laughed hardy, man laughs at me, and continued to saw. Suddenly, they took the saw out and began chopping vigorously. They both jumped down. Cecil shouted, Timber! And Bob echoed, Timber! And with a sound, like the indrawn breath of a giant, the tree fell. It fell between two virgin firs and parallel to the road, so it was easily accessible for sawing and hauling. In fact, it fell to the inch where Cecil had said it would. He was a wizard. But he had his broken skull to prove who was really boss.